Welcome to everyone, both the speakers and the participants, whether in Zoom or in the live stream. My name is Diederich Sparnos. I'm the scientific coordinator of ENSER, and we've organized this series of three webinars about science and policy making in the EU. The issue is that um, policy making in the EU is not that bad. We have relatively good laws um, about chemicals, pesticides, um, endocrine disrupting compounds, genetically modified organisms. Um, according to these laws, the situation should not be that bad at all. Yet in practice, there is a lot of criticism about what we find in the environment, on the fields, in agriculture, and about the state of our health. There's a lot of criticism, both from citizens, from activists, and from scientists. How come this discrepancy between the principles, the laws, and the practice? This is what we're talking about. The first webinar of this series, two weeks ago, um, by Professor Eric Millstone, from the University of Sussex gave you an overview about how science has been used in the EU for policy making to protect public health and environmental health. It um, went into history and uh, he explained how the interpretation of science in policy making in the EU has developed over time in general and in particular for pesticides. This was explained in more detail by Dr. Angeliki Lissimachu of Pesticide Action Network Europe, also in the first webinar yet. Then came the second webinar last Thursday, last week, by Dr. Angelika Hilbeck from the Swiss Institute for Technology. I'm saying that wrongly, um, let me check. The Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, the ETH on GMOs, genetically modified organisms in particular, um, how current risk assessments of GMOs in the EU are actually bound to fail in the way EFSA does them, EFSA is European Food Safety Agency Authority, sorry. And that brings us to today, the third webinar. If you have critique, criticism on the way things are being done, then you should also show a way forward, a way in which it can be done better. And this is what Professor Brian Wynne of the University of Lancaster in the UK is going to do for us today. His talk today will be, is entitled Towards Better Use Science, which also helps meet the democratic legal objectives, legislative objectives for protecting environmental and public health. How can we help the EU to achieve its legal objectives. And they've set a high goal. They promise a high level of protection of people and of nature of the environment. Um, these webinars are intended for online discussion with you, with the participants. You can do so um, in speaking or in writing. You can write questions in the Q&A box. If you press the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can write a question um, and um, if you want to speak, then you can raise your hand digitally by going to the participant list and uh, finding your name and raising your hand, clicking the button that raises your hand. And we'll give you the word in the discussion. In either case, we want you, in both cases, I should say, we want you to uh, state your name and affiliation just like in a normal conference or workshop. We're not dealing with anonymous con comments. Um, yet, uh, in the written case, uh, we will not say your name when we quote your question. Um, that's because we would have to ask each and every one of you for permission to publish it. These webinars are being recorded and the recordings are put online afterwards. Those who speak up um, have actually signed, have agreed by registering, this was on the registration form, by registering they have agreed to have their names and comments and the picture published, the picture if we manage to put your webcams on. I don't know if we'll manage that. Uh, that's been one 
trick we haven't quite learned yet. We're still learning all the technicalities of Zoom webinars. And this is not easy for all of us. So if anything would go wrong this afternoon, please excuse us. Um, we have a very good man in Berlin. That's the only man who's not showing his face here. He's behind the logo of Ensa there. He sits in Berlin and he makes all this possible for us. Um, and I hope he will be able to solve any technical problem we may run into. Let me see, I think I've said everything I should say. If you're in the live stream, you can only ask written comments, you cannot speak up. That's the only difference with Zoom participation. I think that's all I have to say. Um, which means, Brian, I'd like to hand over the screen to you. And Lucas will show your slides. Lucas, could you put up the first slide for Brian, please? Thanks, Diederik. And thanks also to my um, colleagues, uh, uh, Angelica and Eric and Angeliki, who've been previous speakers in this series. Um, we've been speaking about uh, undue reductionism in EFSA risk assessment science. And I use this word science with respect to EFSA risk assessment in a rather generous and loose sense because it is not science. Um, it is something which is called science and recognized by various important institutions as science but there are various ways in which it isn't proper science. And I hope that we've already rehearsed some of these and maybe I can add a few more in this presentation, but I wanna really get to speaking about eventually in this session to um, expansionism in uh, EFSA risk assessment. Uh, in other words, how can we um, improve on the, uh, the quality, the uh, public value, the reliability of EFSA risk assessment, given its crucial importance in um, not just innovation, which goes on in fields of um, agriculture and food production, uh, but also, um, in terms of innovation trajectories and scientific research and development which support those and to try to get us towards um, better science and also um, science and policy from that science which is actually meeting the democratic legal mandates the requirements which have been laid down in European democratic legislation uh, Eric has uh, already given those, but um, if you could switch to the second slide, uh, Lucas. I I'm, I'm remotely operating here from Scotland with a very dodgy um, internet. Uh, and uh, so Lucas is actually sharing this from Berlin with you all. Um, so this is a brief summary of the uh, full session that I'm going to try and share with you here. Um, and I want to start, um, well, this is just outlining how I'm going to move beyond only the scientific um, and what Eric introduced uh, in, was that the first week, wasn't it, on uh, risk assessment policy, which is implicit and value laden uh, whilst not being recognized as such in, in what's called EFSA's science and its risk assessment. Um, so I'm going to move through that and describe how those choices could be different. They are choices, they're not required by nature or by any other um, independent uh, agency they are chosen by EFSA uh, 
and by its policy client and funder, the European Commission. And these are things which we need to address and look at critically and they also just need to be rendered more accountable generally uh, in these processes. So I'm going to refer to ways in which that could be done, but also I'm going to start with something which is in within the science itself, which are values also. And these are normally referred to as the epistemic norms, which actually shape and define good science. Um, the, the dominant one of those is precision. Um, and with precision comes a conflict with other legitimate and necessary scientific norms, such as realism. It's not very good to do scientific knowledge and call it truth, which is actually based upon unrealistic observations, uh, experiments and designs and so on. Neither is it, when, especially when we come to address environmental risk assessment for environmental policy, it's not particularly useful to actually insist upon reduced scope of your questions. Uh, and that includes going beyond laboratory knowledge to ask under what conditions might this laboratory knowledge, artificial knowledge, non-realistic knowledge, might it be legitimate as a representation of the knowledge which we require to understand and indeed regulate or uh, inform practices which go on all over the European Union's environment. We're talking here about European Union policy uh, and European Union science when it comes to EFSA and its opinions which inform the European Commission's approvals or uh, if we could see such things ever uh, refusals of applications to release GMOs and other chemicals and um, other agents like pesticides into the environment. So there are conflicting norms. The norms which define good science are multiple and they're not always mutually consistent or uh, aligned. They can actually and do actually conflict. And there needs to be uh, open acknowledgement of that and open uh, accounts of what the choices have been and why. And those value, the values which I'm going to identify here, others, philosophy of science deals with others too, but the important ones for us are precision, a perfectly legitimate and necessary or valuable part of good science. Uh, but also realism and scope and for environment as enlarged scope as possible in the questions you ask, in the observations which you attempt to make and then the understanding which you attempt to develop of the linkages and causal connections which are affecting the environment and human health of course out there and the connections between these various factors. So. Um, reductionist choices which are often made and we described in our paper in, in Environmental Sciences Europe in April of this year um, and whose reference Angelica gave in her session last week, reductionist choices in EFSA risk assessment science are, let us not forget, choices. They are not essentials and those choices need to be justified when we're considering, informing and making decisions upon real world environmental policy issues and actually real world agricultural issues as well. Um, the cho these choices in other words reflect values and they could be different and that's part of what I want to get to uh, by the end of this session and hopefully still give you time right. to put some questions and comments uh, in the discussion. Um, there are many examples which have already been given of scientific choices in F assessment science, at least for GMOs and pesticides, which is actually a large um, and important part of the total of their science. These are made in sessions one and two by Eric and Angeliki Elika. Um, 
and there are also examples of alternative good science cho scientific choices which were not made by EFSA and it's a fair question to ask why not and where are the explanations of the legitimation of those choices which were made. So and then I want to move to larger questions still about why science alone is not enough. We've already encountered that um, particularly from Eric in respect of risk assessment policy which uh, ought to be a lot more familiar than it is within European science and policy circles particularly at EFSA um, because it is in fact a principle issued by the UN Codex, uh, the Food and uh, Agricultural Organization, the Codex Alimentarius, and Eric again has uh, written about this and provided policy reports to the European Union about this too, um, nearly a decade ago. Um, there are concealed policy choices of this kind being made in both the framing and in the practice itself, the interpretation of evidence and data, um, which ought to be deliberated over collectively, not only by EFSA, in fact, not by EFSA as such at all, as a scientific body. These are policy issues, and as the FEO has already explained it, these need to be made by stakeholders and policy makers or risk managers, in other words, in their normal uh definitions of these different uh agencies within the um decisions that are being made um and there are also scientific uncertainties and contingencies in all science including of course efsa science and risk assessment and there are further questions which i'll explain why these arise too logically and rationally uh, from the basis of risk assessment. There are questions about benefits and alternatives uh, and social needs that, this, that the innovations are supposed to be meeting, which must also be considered in order to be able to claim rigorous good science. And then I'll move as a development of this from EFSA's risk assessment to the precautionary principle and the framing which should be there and isn't of EFSA's risk assessment and it's feeding in then to European policy on all of these important health and environmental um, factors like pesticides and GMOs. Um, and it's worth reminding you, I did have a slide of this but I couldn't find it to get it into this presentation. Um, that here we're governing, governing innovation, we're not only governing risk and risk assessment is actually at the very back end of the full life cycle of innovation to impacts. Um, so there are many questions which are not even being asked when we're trying to conduct democratic and scientifically informed governance of innovation. So uh, if you could move me on, Lucas. Um, now, this is just a reminder, so I don't need to dwell on this. You can maybe move us on pretty quickly uh, here. This is just a summary of the mandates in the existing legislation, um, which Eric has already provided in a previous um, uh, session. But, I just added there at the bottom of this slide that there are also relevant here are agreed processes and practices, norms for qualifying as proper science. Um, I'm not going to go into the history and sociology of science here, but uh, if anyone's interested, Robert Merton in 1971 described this in the form of an abbreviation, communality, universality, uh, disinterestedness and organized skepticism. Uh, the latter one alone is uh, a, a, a norm of good science, which actually in these situations, ENSA is actually tr attempting with virtually no resources to provide um, 
the organized skepticism which would actually perhaps transform European science when it comes to EFSA risk assessment into something approaching proper science. But there are other processes which I'll come to in a few years, uh, which are also missing from the science which is called such by EFSA and given um, the, the associated authority when it's dubious as to whether it's uh, that claim is so move me on please next slide uh, Lucas yeah um, so this is just uh, uh, one of my favorite references of many here um, entitled the values of precision a book edited by Norton Wise philosopher of science and historian of science um, at Princeton the values of precision and one essential take-home message from this book which gives a lot more detail and explanation on this point precision is one value among several which define good science and it's precision which basically rules in uh, EFSA science and indeed um, you know more broadly in many domains of academic research science too um, for reasons which are not always clear when we consider the other values which are relevant and as I said which often conflict with precision so I've mentioned two already realism commonsensical to be uh, an important uh, normative principle in defining good science and attempting to fulfill that norm in practice and also um, broader scope we're dealing here with environmental risk assessment albeit in a food safety authority we should be thinking always here food chain and ecological processes full complexities and not simply contained laboratory type uh, forms of knowledge laboratory knowledge is important and valuable but it always has to be qualified by asking the question and how do the conditions of production of this knowledge under artificial controlled conditions unrealistic conditions how will they be relevant and uh, how will they represent the world out there which is variable dynamic largely unknown in many respects and also uh, differentiated there's a along with precision often comes in control often comes standardization and i come back to that later in reference to um, the politics of the processes by which efsa risk assessment is being used in the european union so move me on lucas please next slide um <clears throat> So th this is the uh, philosophy 101, as I call it, elementary philosophy of science uh, that I've already summarized. So next slide, Lucas, please. And by the way, if I move too fast over any of these um, aspects, you will have access fully to the PowerPoint of, uh, I've got loaded here uh, after, the, um, after today's session. <clears throat> This again is just um, a kind of memo, if you like, from the previous two sessions, so I'm not going to dwell on it either. This is effectively a summary of how it is being done wrong at the moment and how standards of good and reliable science for the purposes, let's not forget, for the purposes for which it's meant, uh, are not being fulfilled. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on this. It's incomplete anyway, and it's just for illustration. So next slide, please, Lucas. <clears throat> um, and just to remind us again, Eric's already explained this uh, briefly, at least. These reductionist scientific commitments occur both within the risk assessment, scientific knowledge construction processes, labs, field trials, and, and, and and also in the framing of the scientific risk questions and those choices again are not obligatory um, they're choices and they could be different choices so these themselves need to be comprehensively reviewed and amended so as to render them consistent with the legally mandated norms which define what would count as 
EU good regulatory science. Um, and these are just summaries of those, but also the risk assessment policy point that they're implicit, uh, unspoken, unacknowledged um, normative commitments framing that science, which are known as risk assessment policy, um, as defined in Codex uh, 2003. And actually, uh, in 1983, in the US uh, National Research Council's Red Book um, on risk assessment, risk management, uh, and risk communication uh, in the government process uh, of 1983, uh, a paper and report by Eric uh, on this in 2009. Um, and we've shown it already in the previous sessions and contrary to European claims, which I'll show in a later slide, EFSA's risk assessment science is not consistent with the pre precautionary principle. Indeed, it is often anti-precautionary. And this can, and to be consistent, let alone lawful, must be changed. To make it legal, let's get down to basics here, to make it legal. It's a European institution which is doing this. Um, Next slide, please, Lucas. Uh, and reductionism in the framing of risk assessment questions, it mutually reinforces with reductionism, selectivity and undue selectivity, inappropriate selectivity of disciplinary parad paradigmatic scientific inputs. Toxicology, necessary and legitimate in, as an input to these kinds of questions is only one of several other important and relevant necessary scientific disciplines. That's a very challenging and difficult process to try to actually, um, uh, what's the word, establish in a productive way. As many of you out there will know from whichever fields you're coming. Um, uh, but, it's required if we're going to claim that we're doing good science in these domains, and science which the public ought to be able to trust and lend authority to. So next slide, Lucas. <clears throat> yeah, and further to reductionism as a, an often inappropriate um, uh, epistemic norm for the risk assessment science in play, uh, sessions one and two also noted at several points double standards in risk assessment, systematically downplaying or dismissing evidence of harm from scientists, from independent scientists, peer reviewed publications and so on, while selectively emphasising evidence of safety, even taking it as read. Um, where was the organised scepticism of good science in many of those examples which have already been given. And EFSA has even used fraudulent ghost-written scientific papers in its glyphosate risk assessment uh, of quite recent past. Um, whether it knew they were ghost-written is, is a good question. Probably they didn't, I have to say, but that's a generous understanding or a generous assumption. We don't know, uh, but they were ghost-written they should be now actually written out of the assessments which have been made and to which the European Commission has given authority. <clears throat> These are anti-scientific, they're not merely poor science, they're anti-scientific. Um, and they selectively, um, basically, you know, they should be just simply written out of the record altogether and corrected. Uh, because they've been historically uh, incorporated into various decision processes. Uh, so next slide. <clears throat> next slide, Lucas. Sorry, I'm trying to. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and also in the uh, in EFSA's processes, 
which then feed into EC decisions uh, as scientifically authorised. Um, in addition to the process reductionism and the substantive contents reductionism, which we've already described with EFSA risk assessment, there are legal procedural norms in the surrounding processes which contravene proper scientific procedures also. So for example, applicants' dossiers are not allowed to be communal scientific materials openly accessible for independent peer scrutiny and testing. They're only accessible to the EFSA expert panel and the receiving member state. Moreover, the data therein are often themselves produced and, and edited by the applicant and under such tight commercial demands for speed and economy that full open scientific peer review, even access to key R&D and RA information like identification of materials is simply prevented. There's also a background point about confidential business information, which legally exempts salient data for the risk assessment process um, uh, from uh, being accessible. And these ought, we would suggest, ought de minimis to exclude any data which is necessary for health and environmental safety risk assessment. Um, glyphosate adjuvants was one example given in session one. Next slide, Lucas. Now, as a, you know, to be fair here about reductionism, A, it isn't only an EFSA habit, uh, in doing science. It's also far more general than that. And there are good reasons in many cases why that is true. And we don't want to condemn reductionism as such, uh, as if it's non-scientific or anti-scientific. Uh, it can be perfectly legitimate and valuable. Um, but the questions are often about um, how it's limiting and excluding, without acknowledgement at all, excluding various relevant and important factors for even asking the right questions in risk assessment about possible harms, let alone actually uh, interpreting, substantively interpreting the available data, designing those experiments as well, and so on. Um, and those choices need to be documented and the alternatives which were rejected need to be documented too and justifications given. That doesn't happen at the moment. All of this is about improving the process. Their proposals which we have for uh, improving that process. Um, so next slide Lucas. <clears throat> So I'm now moving to uh, get beyond, um, and there are three general points here. Risk assessment policy, we've already um, discussed, and I won't dwell on that anymore, but we do need to remember it as an important and neglected dimension of the responsibilities of those who claim to be doing good science at EFSA and in related uh, institutions. And there's a further point that scientific knowledge is not only framed uh, with normative commitments and consequences, or commitments which have normative dimensions or consequences, which those making them uh, as self-professed scientists didn't necessarily realise they were making but they need to become more self-reflexive about precisely those processes that they're involved in, in doing. It's also, however, contingent as knowledge and it's incomplete. And these are points which I'll just explain a little bit further. <clears throat> uh, there's a further point here as well, which is that risk assessment is always, for good reason, case by case, etc., is always about one crop release or one chemical. Important harms may ensue uh, 
from a trajectory of accumulated multiple effects, each single one of which may be insignificant, so that a single risk assessment is not necessarily going to capture a significant harmful process of which that one event is part. That's like a normal trajectory of innovation, of development of practice, of commercial um, processes and so on. And this question should be included in regulatory assessment. And its required expertise is much broader than for typical risk assessments as we know them and love them at EFSA. Indeed, Directive 2001-18 it refers to the need for the regulation to include questions about cumulative impacts. Normal developmental trajectories of innovation and practice are cumulative processes of impact. And where are they assessed at the moment? The answer is they're not. And we might ask why uncertainty doesn't encompass this problem but the framing of the risk assessment process is the case by case etc is such that trajectories don't even appear and the third point about going beyond the the science or the risk assessment itself is that there's much more at stake in these decisions about whether to permit or to not permit a very rare kind of decision we should remind ourselves um, that there is much more at stake than only risk as defined by risk assessment scientists in these decision processes and that's a big question but it's one that which we can actually get a grip of if only we would attempt to do that next slide lucas <clears throat> so this is the usnrc's 1983 red book on risk assessment risk management and risk communication in government decision-making processes about uh, chemicals, GMOs, etc. Well, 1983 GMOs were not by then in play, but, um, or at least not as far as we know. Um, but the point I want to dwell on here is just that um, they're referring to the quality of the uncertainty in in the scientific knowledge which has to be dealt with here is the only scientific knowledge uh, available uh, at present um, that there are many of decision points in that science where risk to human health can only be inferred from the available evidence inferred notice not concluded um, both scientific and policy choices may be involved in selecting from amongst different possible inference bridges and they use the term risk assessment policy to differentiate these from the broader social and economic policy issues like what's the acceptable level of risk which are inherent in risk management decisions themselves. Um, now again I'm not going to dwell on this further except well just let's just move to the next slide uh, please Lucas just just a reminder there that those points being made by the NRC and indeed by, by others about those contingencies become much more significant when we're dealing as we are here with environmental risk assessment and I question whether it's appropriate for EFSA as a food safety authority to be dealing with environmental risk questions but that's a difficult kind of division of labor to to be able to institutionalize so this is where we are the key point of the red book um, was that scientific grounds for judging causal effects are invariably incomplete and not incomplete in the way that justifies a safety conclusion um, so differences of scientific inference are likely and they're normal on the basis of what NRC, which is after all a committee composed of scientists. Um, and incompleteness means inevitable uncertainties, unknowns and contingencies in the risk knowledge which is presented as 
authority. There are also inevitable assumptions which shape the resultant scientific judgments and conclusions about what factors are most relevant, about the relative weights of different bodies of evidence, about what comparators define safety, in other words, what defines harm, um, and about what factors can be ignored. Good accountable science would require that all these be openly accountable, inclusively debated between independent scientific peers and their multiple policy aspects deliberated among stakeholders and public representatives, as well as the scientists alone. Um, next slide, Lucas. <clears throat> So here I'm getting into some differentiations which become important when we look at them a bit more carefully um, in terms of risks and uncontrolled risks as well as what we think of as being controlled risks. So when we have a genuine situation of risk, which is very unusual in fact, uh, we, we know both the harm and the known we know the probabilities of those harmful effects. So risk, in other words, is often taken to be the product of the probability of harm over the consequences of that harm. In other words, what's the magnitude? How many deaths? How much uh, devastation of environmental media? Whatever else it might be. Uh, uncertainties are a situation where we may know the possible harmful effects, but we don't know the probabilities of them, the likelihoods of them occurring. And that again can be a matter of lacking scientific research um, on the processes to be able to allow us to define those probabilities. Ignorance, however, is a situation of the science, it's a predicament which science always faces, where we don't know the possible effects. Um, in other words, we don't know which questions to ask. Uh, so we can't possibly know the probabilities of effects which we don't know. Um, and one of the most graphic, but only one of many historical examples here, was CFCs and stratospheric ozone. CFCs were produced uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, regulated by risk assessment, uh, deliberate risk assessment in the 1960s. Um, and then uh, declared by, I think I've got a slide of this, but let's stay here for now. Um, James Lovelock, the, um, the guru of the Gaia um, hypothesis, uh, and, you know, big guru of environmental protection and so on. James Lovelock declared in 1979 that there is no conceivable, I'm quoting verbatim here, there is no conceivable harm which can come from the release of CFCs into the global, envir uh, global atmospheric environment. Uh, Lovelock was actually using CFCs at that time uh, as tracers just for their physical movement of atmospheric circulation globally. They were good tracers, they were easily observed and, and uh, uh, scientifically in the atmosphere at a distance, um, but nobody knew uh, at that stage. So even in 1979, Lovelock was saying this about CFCs. Only six years later, um, uh, um, Joe Farman and his students actually uh, at the British Antarctic Survey um, were publishing their paper in Nature, which was actually noting the uh, huge stratospheric ozone hole which existed in the global stratosphere above the Antarctic uh, and which has now caused somewhere over 30,000 deaths from melanoma, skin cancers, uh, from that uh, loss of ozone uh, and exposures to high ozone levels at the Earth's surface. Um, and the, um, sorry, lack to, to UV from the sun. Um, the, um, the point about that is that even the best science of the day when the material is risk assessed does not necessarily know all of the possible consequences. So we're a long way from a situation even of scientific uncertainty. 
let alone risk, uh, we actually don't know which questions we should be asking. And it was only Farman's paper uh, which actually began to enlighten us about those processes. Um, uh, there's a further side story there about the satellite data which the US uh, NASA had, which actually declared Farman's paper to be mistaken, uh, basically because their satellite data equipment was tuned uh, in order to actually uh, just simply flag, in other words, suspend and put in a side file for possible future scrutiny. Uh, the observation which their satellites did observe of the ozone hole uh, but the automated processes of interpretation of those observations cast them aside as can't possibly be credible they're too far off the expected range and it's interesting the frequency with which we see in EFSA defenses of its own scientific decisions opinions on GMOs and pesticides, how a scientific paper which is reporting observed harm doesn't comply with EFSA's expected levels of exposure. It's a typical one. Uh, expected means it's an assumption. It might be a collective assumption, but it's still an assumption. It's not an empirically tested belief and it shouldn't be given the weight of observations. So uh, another point there, but I'm getting off the point of the forms of uncertainty which prevail in scientific knowledge. Ambiguity is a condition where it's implicit as a risk assessment policy choice. What we choose to decide is the appropriate uh, or the, the object which we're protecting. Is it only human mortality? Is it also human morbidity? Why is it only human? Why not other uh, fauna and why not flora? Um, there are lots of questions there which again are not sufficiently deliberated and which get embedded implicitly within what's called the scientific knowledge without any recognition and that is a big problem. Um, but they can be changed, that's the point. These points uh, can actually be changed by rendering them accountable and sharing them and making criticism a legitimate and indeed necessary part of the development of better and more reliable science for precaution. The ultimate policy principle underlying European policy in these and other domains. And there are indeterminacies which are relevant in the form of system complexities which escape repeatable deterministic control, for example, controlled laboratory conditions, uh, even if they're known. Um, and the question about the validity of lab data for different uncontrolled and variable field conditions. <coughs> and the point is um, that uh, all of these latter qualities, indeterminacies, ambiguity, ignorance, and even uncertainty, are often simply reduced to risk. In other words, they're deleted, because risk is a situation where we can do a controlled risk assessment. And that is an untypical situation for many of the conditions which that risk science is attempting to represent. So um, risk scientists also often assume very mistakenly that risk is the only kind of public concern and the natural meaning therefore of the public issue. And we can't go into this today, but that has led to so many problems of public trustworthiness and indeed public respect for the scientific bodies like EFSA but member states, single bodies too, uh, which have been dealing with GMOs and pesticides and often licensing them for commercial use with inadequate forms of uh, inspection and assessment. Um, so 
research science might well deal with you, with all of those uh, indeterminacies, ignorance, ambiguities. Uh, not always, but uh, it usually attempts to, and it usually does. Uh, but science for policy certainly does not. And this is a distinction which, again, we need to be much more uh, attentive to and demanding about in these domains, such as um, EFSA's risk assessment science and its uses within the European Commission and European Union. <coughs> Next slide, please, Lucas. <clears throat> now, yeah, I think I'm going to have to move more quickly here. So can you move on from this, Lucas, and anyone can move back to it and read it more deliberately when they've got their own time. Um, this is just an indication of the ways in which scientists misunderstand the presence of scientific ignorance in their own knowledge. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is packing in, so it's time for me to finish. <coughs> this is the verbatim transcript from a meeting of the then existent uh, Agriculture and Environmental Biotechnology Commission, a public meeting in Europe in 2000, in London, sorry, in 2001, used to be Europe anyway. Um, so the, uh, a member of the Agriculture and Environment Biotechnology Commission, actually a very good friend and colleague of mine, Robin Grove White, asked a question of the UK uh, ACRE, the Advisory Committee on Releases to the Environment Chair, so the UK equivalent of EFSA when it comes to GMOs. He asked him whether he thought people were reasonable to have concerns about possible ignorance uh, in scientific knowledge where GM plants are concerned. The chair asked which unknowns, which is a rather um, ambiguous and curious question. Uh, by definition, you don't, do not know what your unknowns are. Um, that's precisely the point. They're not possible to specify in advance. And the Acre Chair's reply, I'm afraid it's not possible for me to respond unless you give me a clear indication of the unknowns you're speaking about. So the AEBC member, in that case, don't you think you should add health warnings to the advice you're giving ministers indicating there may be unknowns which you can't address? And the Acre Chair's then response, no, as scientists, this is the final dismissal. We have to be specific. We can't proceed on the basis of imaginings from some fevered brow. Uh, well, the reference there, of course, to hysterical publics and uninformed publics. Um, next slide, Lucas, please. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, so this, the chair of Acre, who happened to be somebody I know, Alan Gray, um, a terrestrial ecologist, they don't have a language, as he just showed. They don't have a language for speaking about scientific ignorance. So it's a bit difficult to fulfill the question uh, which my colleague put of uh, Alan Gray in that exchange. Why don't you add a health warning, which uh, goes to all ministers. Um, sorry, I've just messed up here my... Um, my screen and now I can't read it. Uh, I just have to somehow get that. That's it. Sorry, I just lost full screen and it's not big enough when it's uh, on that. <clears throat> um, uh, so there's a need for scientists to just simply acknowledge the existence of scientific ignorance, the existence therefore of lack of control in the advice which they're giving in the EFSA's case to the European Commission and in any member states advisory committee's case to their relevant minister or government officials. Um, this would be a start and 
it would be an appropriate modesty of science uh, in order to do that. Um, but there's simply no present recognition even of that as a condition which needs to be dealt with in these situations. This is what leads to the surprises that, for example, caused over 30,000 deaths in the case of uh, CFCs and the ozone hole. And this is what is under, you know, underpins a lot of the reasoning which lies under, you know, behind the precautionary principle as a necessary component of policy, indeed a foundation of policy in these kinds of domains. Um, when surprises happen also, if you could give them the next slide please, um, Lucas. <coughs> uh, <coughs> This is just summarizing the logic of the move from a recognition of ignorance and actually ordinary publics recognize that point about lack of control and surprise. It's typical in everyday life for ordinary people. They deal with it every day of their lives in one way or another and they manage it. Um, it doesn't cause them to riot on the streets or to go hysterical uh, or anything like that they deal with it and they recognize it. And it's often the denial of ignorance on the part of scientists, which is the more prominent part of the problem because that generates public skepticism. It generates it. The public wasn't skeptical because it was too difficult for them to understand, which they also recognize typically. It was, they were skeptical because they didn't see what they should have seen as the full package, which includes acknowledging the bits that we don't control, or at least that we don't control some bits which we don't necessarily know about yet. And there is a point about adequate supporting research and development for the risk assessment process itself. It can't operate in a vacuum and it needs to be able to draw upon good, rich, diverse, deep, long-term, scientific research which is often not funded or if it is funded it's funded by corporate institutions who have self-interest which lead them to be very selective about what they will fund so <clears throat> people ask questions like where's their plan b and do they really think they don't need one because none is usually apparent and when they happen who will be in charge of the responses to those surprises when they happen and the further question, rational as a consequence from that, can we trust them to act properly when they are given charge of those surprise events? The trustworthiness problem, a uh, question rather, is often said to be a soft-headed, touchy-feely, emotional public concern, but it arises rationally from the reality of unacknowledged scientific ignorance underlining risk underlying risk assessment science. <clears throat> ignorance is not itself grounds for criticism. It might be if it's deliberately created and it is sometimes deliberately created. Uh, but that and consequent mistrust comes from its normal denial, i.e. the criticism I mean, uh, comes from its normal denial by scientific policy authorities, not the fact that they are carrying scientific ignorance with their science. <clears throat> this has never been aired, as far as I'm aware, in relation to EFSA's science. Um, yet yeah, EFSA's problems of public mistrust are serious and they're central. And I would suggest that a major part of that is not only the conflicts of interest which are documented for EFSA's panel scientists, expert panel scientists, um, but for, uh, you know, this is a problem uh, for EFSA's mistrust and lack of credibility, lack of respect, really, amongst European publics in itself. So next slide, Lucas, please. <clears throat> um, so uh, I'm now tossing and turning because I think I'm going to, uh, move on from this. Please read this in the slides um, in full, but I simply don't have time now. <clears throat>
to deal with it and um yeah let, let's uh, finish on this point so the EFSA's risk assessment science as authorized and endorsed by the European Commission and the European Union's Council of Ministers through the Commission and so on EFSA's risk assessment science insists upon the scientific validity and authority of a singular risk assessment for all European environments. Now there have been many disputes from member states, different member states, with European Commission decisions to approve different GMOs uh, during its lifetime since 2002, um, that where the European member state has basically provided a counter evidence, a critique of the EFSA's scientific opinion approving the GMO, in other words, declaring it safe in Europe's environment, when they've used that standardized, unified, uh, singular European Union model of the environment as the frame of their risk assessment. Now, that's the Commission's normal public stance, and I justify it by reference to science. When the European Commission had to construct a case for its defence in the World Trade Organization's complaint made by the US, Argentina and Canada against the EU's effect in practice moratorium on the importation of uh, mainly US then, but now Argentinian and some Canadian, no, not Canadian, I don't think, but anyway, US and now Argentinian, um, uh, maize and soya uh, G for GM feed and food. Um, the, the European Union switched completely. It simply dis reject or it didn't reject, it discarded that model which has been defending insistently even through the European courts against member states, that singular unified standardized model of the European environment. Let's just have a look at how it dealt with that. So next slide, this, this by the way, is a report produced in just a year after the World Trade Organization's uh, the case, the disputes panel case of the US and co against the European Union. Uh, the evidence that the European Commission provided against the US's complaint to defend itself with the disputes panel of the um, WTO was provided in 2005 uh, in confidence to the disputes panel, a scientific body again, global scientific body. Uh, and uh, if we move to the next slide, we see um, the uh, an excerpt from some of that evidence. <clears throat> so this is from the, um, the European Commission's uh, response to the US complaint to the, the WTO disputes panel. Uh, <clears throat> you can see here, I, I won't read it in full because I'm trying to save a bit of time and, and cut off at this point, uh, but you can see that basically they're, they're disputing uh, the idea that we can actually universalize um, risk assessments of the kind that they had themselves have themselves and continue themselves to universalize in EFSA, um, that you simply can't translate and extrapolate the limited risk assessment results on toxicity of BT maize uh, to human and non-target organisms from US, Australia or some other non-European countries because the regional growing environments, the scale of farm fields, the crop management practices, local regional target and non-target species considered most important in the agroecosystem, interactions between cultivated crops and surrounding biodiversity, each could differ from published non-European studies and could differ substantially between regions and countries within the EC. 
suddenly they have demolished their own singular standardized model of the European environment, which is the essential basis for any EFSA risk assessment, environmental risk assessment of GMOs, indeed of pesticides too. Um, it's starkly opposite this notice confidential, originally confidential until Friends of the Earth Europe and Greenpeace Europe extracted it from uh, the Commission under Freedom of Information legislation. Um, but it's starkly opposite from uh, the, 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 the uh, existing and still institutionalized, still dominant, still insistently legalistically used to, um, well, actually, no, not now, uh, for the reasons of the 2015 directive, um, that the, uh, the stance just completely switched opportunistically. So we have to ask, okay, so which one is true? Uh, I mean, this is like, uh, which one, as Donald Trump might say, is fake news. This is like a post-truth kind of situation from a body which is claiming to be fully trustworthy, fully open, fully rigorously scientific, independent, impartial. And here we have the EC basically saying what EFSA says to you in those domains is not true. So uh, next slide, please, Lucas. <clears throat> So there is potential for serious and irreversible harm, according to this World Trade Organization evidence of the EC, from the use of GMOs and considerable uncertainties exist and there are gaps in knowledge. Um, this is just a quote from Friends of the Earth Europe and Greenpeace Europe in that document whose uh, cover page I just showed you. Uh, it's still available, by the way, on the web. Um, <clears throat> So uh, it basically, according to them, is giving the biotechnology industry rather than the environment the benefit of the doubt. And in doing this, the Commission is failing to implement the precaution principle as required in law. And it's also failing to implement the, direct, the legal directives and the legal regulation, which Eric Millstone um, uh, described and explained in session one. <coughs> um, so uh, I th think I've got to finish here. I've already extended too long. There are some more important points in the rest of this presentation. I can't remember what slide I'm on and I can't see, um, but there's still probably another 12 or 15 slides which are going into other dimensions of what science is or should be for? What's its purpose in uh, the conduct and framing and interpretation of risk assessments, uh, environmental and human and health risk assessments uh, for uh, pesticides and for GMOs, for food additives, for other chemicals, and the full range of commercial products or future commercial products, which EFSA is standing as basically the only regulatory hurdle, the only place where uh, questions are asked of the products themselves and the corporations, which are actually promoting and um, pushing these kinds of products. Um, the, the European Environment Agency in 2002 and 2013 produced two volumes uh, uh, on the um, late lessons, as it called it, from early warnings. David G, uh, a colleague and ENSA member, was really the person who takes credit for these studies. He was actually an official at the European Environment Agency at that time. And I happen to be co-editor of, uh, of the first volume. But all in all, 34 case studies were provided of cases where there were early warnings and the early warnings were either rejected or ignored, not seen perhaps, but anyway, they had no effect whatsoever. 
and harmful effects were in, were you know uh, basically dumped on innocent victims often in large numbers uh, there are so many cases i can't mention them here but you can read about those in the further slides but also in the original uh, eea volumes as well i think the references are also on the relevant slides so uh, thanks very much my apologies for being too long and i hope at least we can have some brief questions but also please any responses to both ENSA and to myself personally i hope you saw my email on the um, opening slide but i'm not difficult to find uh, i think it's still true to say um, so you can pursue me if you need to or wish to thanks very much um, Back to you, Diedrich. Thank you very, very much, Brian. Yes, I would like to applaud. It's a pity of Zoom, of online webinars that you can't hear any applause, but I'm sure the participants would also applaud you. Um, and I think we can say that contrary to your excessive modesty, the skepticism that you have displayed in this talk is extremely organized. Um, I think you've, uh, you've pointed the way. Thank you. I think you've pointed the way just by pointing out um, all the missing aspects of good science um, in the EU science, in the science of EU institutes, um, in the science as practiced by EU institutes. All these missing aspects um, should be brought back and as you said um, they are very often many of them present in normal research science um, so the examples are there and um, the EU institutes and other risk assessment institutes in the world should just, should just um, have the courage to practice them now over to you, the audience. I don't see any hands raised, um, nor do I see any questions. Yes, there is one, sorry. Um, there is a first question in the Q&A box. Can you get it on your screen, Brian? Um, sorry, read. I'm just switching screens back from my PowerPoint to Zoom. So just give me a second and I'll no do problem. Um, yeah, now I just need to expand this. Why don't you just read it? Yes, I will. <coughs> yeah. uh, it says Brian's reflection. <coughs> Brian's reflections seem to be repeated presently in the debate about regulations, re the new genetic engineering methods, deregulate, re-regulate, or simply apply the existing GMO legislation. Do you agree that your um, reflections are repeated there? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid that's true. Uh, it's it's difficult to disagree with that kind of judgment, Rudiger. So, um, thanks for extending me forward to the present. There. <coughs> well, unfortunately, GMOs are also present. I've got to say. I mean, the conventional uh, GMOs are also present, as well as the uh, new kinds of GMO. Right, in editing as it's normally referred to. Yes, yeah. There's another question. Um, in your article, Knowledge and Political Order in the EEA, yeah. you describe the genesis of this agency where the EEA, the European Environmental Agency, fought for a less reductive role than the one envisioned initially by DG Environment. They were asked to provide standardized, <coughs> sorry, standardized objective information, but opted for a more innovative research design, more inclusive. EFSA was created a few years after the EEA. Why two EU agencies with similar and often intersecting mandates and they took a different path? Yeah, uh, thanks Alice for, for that question. Uh, I mean, the first thing I'd want to say is that uh, your last kind of clause is it no a sentence EFSA was created a few years after the EEA um, uh, 
provided to agencies with similar and often intersecting mandates. Uh, that point about similar and often intersecting mandates is not true at all. I'll explain that in a second. And they were indeed on different paths right from the start. If you go to the original, uh, the original, I think there were the regulations which originally provided the terms of reference for both uh, EFSA and the European Environment Agencies, you'll see how different they are. Uh, just to summarise, the European Environment Agency, and as it happens, I was made um, a management board and a scientific committee member of the European Environment Agencies, which was inaugurated and located in Copenhagen in 1994. And actually, uh, it's a long story. I can tell you at another time if you like, but basically I was appointed as one of two uh, independent uh, European Parliament, constitutionally the European Parliament, the European Commission and the European Statistics uh, Body had the right to appoint two members uh, to the management board of the agency of the EEA uh, along with a, each member state plus the member states expanded to include Switzerland and um, uh, and uh, various others, Iceland and so on, uh, but also um, uh, the, it was the chair of the Environment Committee of the Parliament, no longer in existence, uh, Ken Collins at that time, who appointed me to become a management board member. So I saw a lot of this from the inside. There was a huge conflict between the European Commission and a minority of the management board of the agency, which included myself and Michael Skoulos, the, uh, the other uh, parliament appointed um, uh, management board member, um, to try to fight the commission's control of the agency. And the commission attempted to insist by interpreting the mandate for the agency in a particular way uh, which was you're an information body only and by the way environmental information means only information about the state of the environment in different member states and David G who takes credit for the uh, hugely successful and influential late lessons from early, early warnings precautionary principle volumes. David was a senior official at the agency at the time too. Um, David also supported me and Michael and others in attempting to push the definition of the agency's mandate to include more than state of the environment information. So we concocted, we invented a uh, an acronym, if I can remember it, DPSIR. Uh, in other words, we also need to provide the uh, European policymakers, not only the Commission, but member states and the Parliament and, uh, and others, we need to provide them with, with environmental information on drivers. Uh, P, what was P? Oh God, I've forgotten, I'm afraid. Uh, <coughs> uh, anyway, Stressors, that's right. Drivers, no, P wasn't stressors, was it? My alphabet's wrong. Um, uh, S was stressors, P was maybe pressures, but anyway, upstream information about what is causing those environmental problems. Crucial, you know, for policymakers in the Commission if they were going to do their job properly and protect the European environment we have to move upstream in not only in terms of the information, but also the other questions we ask, including about what the alternatives are to this particular innovation. So the, the interpretation of what counts as environmental information was against the militant opposition of the commission. It was actually expanded to include those dimensions as well. And that basically led us to the precautionary principle too, to our particular interpretation of the 
precautionary principle in late lessons, even in volume one, was far more expansive than that which the commission claims to, I wish I'd got to that slide, um, but there's a slide in which I quote the European Commission where it basically says that, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, I've got to emphasize, that uh, risk assessment, the science in other words, does not need uh, to be brought under the precautionary principle uh, policy of the European Union because it is already precautionary. Scientists always apply caution in their interpretation of whatever evidence they're dealing with. So they assume on faith that science is always precautionary. And as I hope you've seen by now from all of the evidence, that's just completely untrue. I'm getting off the point of your question. So the European Environment Agency innovated and I've got to say, largely thanks to David G and his, you know, his vision and his commitment. Um, but with support from others too, uh, and others with influence, including a senior scientist or two on the Scientific Advisory Committee. And we eventually broadened it out. But it's still partly, you know, thanks to that conflict, its influence on the European Union's policies is, except in very particular cases, not really very strong, not strong enough. And EFSA, of course, as you know, had completely different terms of reference written into its constitution. And one of those, you'll see this in a later slide, wasn't actually, but it was interpreted that, that way by the very first commissioner for health and consumer protection, now DG Sante, uh, who was David Byrne, the Irish um, lawyer, politician, uh, who was brought in uh, as the commissioner uh, at that time. He, he gave a speech at the inaugural management board meeting of EFSA in 2002. And I've quoted this in another slide uh, in the presentation. I'm sorry, I didn't get there. Uh, and Byrne basically says, we will use the scientific authority of EFSA in order to control conflicts between member states and between member states and the commission. Now, it didn't work in fact, and over GMOs in particular, that was precisely what led to the conflicts between Austria, which insisted that scientifically in a proper environmental risk assessment of Austrian conditions, which are part of European Union conditions, you have to include the fact of, I don't know what the up-to-date figure, but back then in 2009 or so, uh, 2008, 2009, it was already over 20% of existing agricultural land use was organic. And the number of farms was even higher because those farms tended to be smaller. So you had a very significant organic component where the coexistence rules which were brought in to try to deal with that were never credible as an effective exclusion zone for GM crops. There's no way you could actually operate that containment to the extent which would be needed under those coexistence rules. So those failed and the conflicts existed, many conflicts in the European Union. It was a bit scary for European Union uh, officials and politicians because of course the whole point was no more conflict uh, in Europe, going right back to the setting up of the European coal and steel community in 1956. So th the point is that EFSA's mandate was always being interpreted with an implicit agenda, which was unity. And unity for the Commission in their imagination meant standardization. It didn't need to. Emphatically, it did not need to. But from that official point of view, it was assumed 
we have to standardize, we have to use science to standardize and unify Europe. And I've written on this and Les Levidoff, uh, a member of ENSA also has written on this. Um, and again, I think the reference to Les's paper at least is in the slides later on. Um, so, uh, there's more European questions. Should, yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, I'll Let's finish there because there's more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your your slides are indeed a treasure trove of information. I hope all the participants get the time to read them at their ease. Um, the next question is in fact in fact split into two. The first one being. So risk assessment bodies should be renamed uncertainty assessment bodies to better reflect the absence of hard data specific or specific evidence, question mark. And the oh, second- Oh yes, sorry, yes, yes. I'll take uh, that one first. Oh yeah, hi Cora, um, good to see you here. <laughs> I'll hear you here, um, at least I'll read you here. Um, so, um, well, yes and no. Um, I mean, as I indicated, uncertainty itself is typically actually interpreted uh, amongst the scientific domains which feed into risk assessment and decision making on risk. Uh, uncertainty tends to be interpreted in a very limited way, which is that it's only temporary imprecision. And, you know, tomorrow's research or tomorrow's monitoring will actually eradicate that uncertainty, then we'll have only risk and certainty and confidence, full confidence. And I'd want to include the contingencies which should be part of an uncertainty assessment and the ambiguities, risk assessment policy actually. Uh, and also to the extent it can be, and I accept it can't be fully um, specified. You can't measure ignorance. You can't specify ignorance by definition it's an unknown, but you can acknowledge and deal with it. And one of the logical ways of dealing with it is consider the alternatives and actually give those alternatives where they look likely. And, you know, the alternatives to GMOs, for example, have got a long history of effective, empirically proven effectiveness. And they still feed about 60 to 70% of the world's population. So why don't we, why aren't we considering the alternatives and providing them with the kind of R&D that would support them when we're starving them? So uh, that's, that's my, my response to the uncertainty assessment question. But yes, it would, as you say, better reflect the absence or the uh, it's not the absence entirely, but almost absence of hard data and specific evidence, which is directly relevant to the questions that we should be asking. Yeah. The second one I'm just reading now, the difference between assessment processes and scientific processes. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, as we've said already, Cora, on the second question, uh, Assessment is partly policy and partly science. As you know, as I quoted in the US National Research Council document in 1983, and as in the Codex Alimentarius uh, um, Commission's agreement, which let's recall again, Eric emphasizes, the European Union and each member state has signed up to which means we should be deliberating over accountably risk assessment policy. And that should not, not be being left only to EFSA as a so-called scientific body. And then I wouldn't call EFSA a scientific body as I indicated at the outset, but didn't explain, but I hope it's explained now. Science for me, and I did used to practice science of this kind, but as a material scientist, a physical scientist, not as a biologist uh, at Cambridge University, science for me does involve openness, communality, equally and uh, unrestrictedly shared data with everybody who's a peer. Universality, we deal with everything by the same standards, not by the things we favour with a loose standard and the things we don't like 
a strict standard, no. Common universal standards for every different body of evidence we're dealing with. Uh, disinterestedness, impartiality in other words, we know about the importance of that and we know about its uh, sometimes uh, its disappearance. Uh, um, organized skepticism, the last one, uh, there are only four actually, there are five uh, letters but only four uh, principles. Uh, organized skepticism, well as I've indicated that is, uh, it doesn't exist as a qualification of those other criteria, communality, openness in other words, um, and um, as we've shown, um, universality. Consistency, you know, common sense word consistency does not apply with much of EFSA's science. So, uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, I want to say no it shouldn't. Uh, under the ideal kind of independent science that you and I know and hope for, <laughs> Um, as university science is increasingly corralled and controlled by uh, other agendas and other funds. Uh, we know the conditions that come with a lot of that. Um, so anyway, I hope I've gone far enough uh, on that one. We have two questions okay. left, one written and okay. one oral okay. question. Yeah. This is Veronika Patrova. I'll allow you to speak now, Veronika. Okay. Hi, thank you. Hi, hi Brian. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, and I have a question, perhaps not only for you, but also for the other um, speakers. Uh, if, Good, you yeah. could, if you could tell us how um, or what points of your criticism and suggestion have been taken on board by EFSA over the years. Thank you. Uh, well, I should be looking at Eric and Angelica here. Um, uh, you came to a meeting, Veronica, in, um, where was it? Somewhere in Switzerland, Angelica, remind us. No, uh, I should tell. But with the European Commission, as well as with some EFSA representatives uh, on a project, RAGES, which, as you know, criticizes uh, much of EFSA's risk assessment of GMOs. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I want to hear Angelica and Eric on this, but my, my sense is from lots of written exchanges and hearing and uh, reading EFSA, uh, EFSA journal uh, materials and so on, far too little would be my um, judgment of it. Uh, there needs to be a lot more. But I want to emphasize there, that's a responsibility not only of EFSA, that's also a responsibility of the European Commission in the form usually of DG Sanko or DG Sante rather now. Um, in other words, the agency most responsible for the health and safety policies and regulations and the implementation of those um, uh, of the Commission. I it's think not only EFSA's responsibility. I think to Eric, sorry. Yes, if, if I may risk respond assessment. as well. Sorry, if I may respond as well. Um, I think that I have encountered occasions with EFSA members of staff a, who have acknowledged at least some of the criticisms of the sort we've advanced, but as an institution, there's much less explicit willingness to deal with it. But I think the important development has come not from EFSA or from the European Commission, but from the European Parliament that has, an imp that has imposed upon EFSA an obligation to become increasingly transparent. And my understanding of the legislation is that this transparency requirement should be fully enforced from next spring. And under those circumstances, when 
if and when EFSA becomes increasingly transparent, it will be increasingly difficult for EFSA to conceal the extent to which it is making policy judgments that masquerade as scientific judgments. And therefore, the process of making, of changing EFSA's behavior is, um, how shall I put it, a battle still to be fought, but we are being, I believe, equipped with some tools for that struggle by the European Parliament, which we haven't previously possessed. Yeah. <clears throat> Very nicely put. Let me add a little bit to it as well from my practice, because we've been pushing them uh, with the, the science and the research in the risk assessment or some of the risk assessment part for many, many years. And it feels um, hugely frustrating, but um, we've made, on some occasions, we have made in ways, I presented one of those occasions last time when I presented um, our, my talk or my, my part, my webinar, where I said we've developed uh, risk assessment concepts on how you should be doing it to be more broad in its scope and include more hazard scenarios and um, carry out more realistic and meaningful um, types of testings. So that concept has been pushed into some of the guidances of, or one guidance on environmental risk assessment of EFSA. However, they have put it so downstream while installing a narrow filter at the top that for those that even make it for those risk scenarios or questions that you're allowed to even ask to make it through that filter, it becomes almost meaningless that then you can uh, assess them in, in, if you wish, in more breadth and detail. So, but we have to acknowledge um, it's in there. There's this, another thing, as Eric was saying, when you meet people and the staff on a personal basis, you know, and you discuss with them, they, you know, they, they, they cannot, you know, say they agree or they see the validity of, of our argument, whether they think it should be part of the risk assessment or not, is, is then a, a personal uh, a decision or opinion on that, but the, the scientific argument is, is accepted. However, they cannot, of course, officially do that because if they now, 10 years down the road, all of a sudden accept that our arguments that some of the testing and some of the, the approaches they used 10 years ago were flawed and were scientifically invalid. The protocols were invalid, et cetera, et cetera. I've been fighting this for the late spring, et cetera, for many years. They acknowledged that. And they, we saw slowly a shift in what they accepted as valid, but they were always very, very careful not to acknowledge that this was because they took up the criticism that was given to them by others, but kind of tried under face-saving terms to change it and, you know, ex request different types of data with different types of protocol, even acknowledging that, you know, some of the pathways, if you do it this way, are not, are not proper, but they cannot officially or forthcomingly acknowledge that because then it means the risk assessments they've done 10 years ago are all invalid. And that would just, the whole house of cards would collapse over them and they would have to start it all, all over again because some of the products are still out there. And they are out there based on approval, based on the data, that's shoddy data. And if you admit this later, then you have a legacy of shoddy data you have to deal with and you base your position upon that people will come and challenge you on if they're still out there. So it's, they are stuck in a bit. I understand that they are in an uncomfortable situation and the paid staff just has to defend what, what, what they're being told, what they have to defend, whether it makes sense to them or not. So it is difficult to get them to, you might see change slowly, 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 so you don't really realize it and they will never acknowledge that this is because they accepted your criticism, even though sometimes they used the exact same terms and even the same wording as so, you know. So it, it's difficult, yeah, very yeah. difficult. Where I, what I would like to add though, is where I did find, because Brian raised the issue, he, he raised the case of the WTO legal case that the US, Argentina and Canada had launched against the EU. 
I was part of that process. And I remember the day when they called me up and asked me if I would want to serve on behalf of the EU on their panel of experts to counter that the arguments coming from the other side. And I was totally, you know, like, oh my God, all of a sudden you recognize us. And there were a number of us that they on other panels were fighting foot and nail their scientific advice. But here it came in handy and that report that the F Friends of the Earth have been reporting about is full, is a beautiful hundreds of pages report of all of our arguments in defense of the EU. And with that defense, they, they kind of, they didn't win. It was not winnable because some of the arguments of the member states in order to install the moratorium were really bad, but they got the most out of it. And that was based on our advice that we gave them, but we would never acknowledge. <laughs> so that's just how it is. That's a game of politics. That's the politics behind science, isn't it? So it is. We have one question left. I should apologize uh, for us running so late um, with a quarter of an hour over time now. This, this last question goes, congratulations, really. That's for you, Brian. Please comment on the effect of controlling the perception of risk by issuing the definitions of the matter of the matters. The concept of diversity, both biological and cultural, is at stake with GMOs and pesticides. Please comment on how to reinforce the importance of biocultural diversity. The cases of native corns and bees in Mexico are in my mind. And the ongoing class action lawsuit against transnational corporations. Don't say the name of the asker, please, Brian. We promise that for privacy reasons. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, well, thanks for the congratulations. Um, uh, uh, I confess that, you know, having spent a fair amount of my career working on climate change and uh, a bit more of that time in activist uh, initiatives on climate change as well, I'm a bit perplexed as to how it is that global biodiversity extinction, you know, we're in the sixth extinction, I don't need to tell you that, um, and we're losing species of all kinds faster than we can even begin to identify them. Um, I'm perplexed as to why it is that the importance of biodiversity hasn't been recognized as the same as for climate change or human induced climate change and the need for human remedial action on both of them together. Um, so how to reinforce the importance of biodiversity? First of all, I completely agree that that reinforcement uh, is, is really you know, vitally necessary and it's urgent, just as urgent, I would say, as climate change and actually going in the wrong direction. And as nearly all of the relevant scientific bodies have pointed out, um, land use, for which they really mean industrialised agriculture, is the major driver of biodiversity loss. Um, so we need to be doing something radical about industrial agriculture, global wide, uh, even in those countries that we tend to think of uh, as being dominated by uh, subsistence, small scale, biodiverse forms of agroecology, even if not officially labeled that, like India, for example, um, that's where the action is needed as far as I can see but how we actually uh, reinforce that recognition um, just all the usual ways first of all good and more relevant R&D which is actually not just monitoring but actually showing what the causal drivers and uh, practices are that need to be changed if we want to do something serious about uh, improving the situation. Um, so I, I don't feel as if I can help you 
very much, um, particularly not in your own context. Um, because I do think that uh, a lot of the action has to be regionally tailored, both biologically and politically, uh, uh, as you indicate in your question. <clears throat> so please, Eric and Angelica. Yeah, I, I think this is really leading us to um, much the broader issues where, interestingly, many of us who've started out in the, D in the GMO debate have ended up in, later, in their later life and their later careers is fighting for transformation of agriculture and, and pushing agroecology agendas. You know, that, that's where it falls in and that's where it logically leads you to when you take for, for serious and walk the talk that you talk about, you will automatically get towards, you know, we must change the system and transform it from the bottom up. And just a little piece of self-advertisement, if you allow me. This is a book that we have just published. Some of you may know or remember. That's a, a, a follow-up on the World um, Weltagrarbericht, the uh, ISTAT report, of which uh, I was also an author. And some of the authors, or 40 of the authors there, came together and wrote a follow-up report, book on transformation of our food systems and the making of the paradigm shift. And this is where we are, you know, we're looking for what happened since we published that big report, which was on the equal eyesight, Brian, it was a sister report to the IPCC report, also run by Bob Watson, who was inspired yeah. together with Hans Seren and a bunch of people to launch a similar uh, report and process next to the IPCC, because they realized we cannot only talk about climate change or you will not tackle climate change if you don't go about changing and making major adjustment, adjustments to our agriculture land use system all over the world. So that's where it will lead us and that's where the resolution of this will, uh, will, will rest in, in my view. But that's a bit out of the scope of what we've been doing with our risk assessment treatments. Yeah. Right. If there's nothing more to be added to this, that's one of the most difficult questions, isn't it? Uh, looking at the future and asking what to do. Um, Transform. Yeah, exactly. Answer. <laughs> Answer can be very short. <laughs> Still needs to be done. Uh, there's a final remark in the Q&A box saying, thank you, Brian and Enzo, for these many brilliant eye-openers. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you. To it took us almost two hours this one, so <laughs> thanks for staying with us. Most of you are still there, that's, that's quite impressive. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Thank you to all the participants for listening and making this worthwhile to do. And a big thank you to all three speakers and the fourth one in absentia, Angeliki Lisimachu. Um, we hope to see you in future webinars. Keep an eye on our website, we'll announce everything there. In fact, we have a big roundtable webinar next Tuesday about Corona, COVID-19. You might be interested in that. Totally different subject, but also about good science or what good science should be. Thanks again and bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.